Elon Musk was born in South Africa. At 12 years old, he sold his first piece of commercial software he programmed. Years later, he went on to make his fortune during the Internet boom, making just under $200 million with PayPal and just over $20 million with Zip2. Now, 39 years later, Elon is building rocket ships and making electric cars as the CEO of SpaceX and Tesla Motors. Elon's dream is to make living on Mars a reality, maybe an affordable reality, during his lifetime. Here's my interview with Elon Musk, one of the most celebrated entrepreneurs today. So clearly you have many aspirations and an overwhelming drive to innovate. Take us back to when you were young. What were you like? What did you do? And how was yeah. motivation and drive sort of manifested and cultivated? Um, so I definitely was, was very driven as a kid um, and, and very willful. Um, one of the things that I remember most from my childhood is um, I was, uh, I think, six or something, maybe around that age. Um, I was just learning to read, basically, um, and uh, I was um, grounded one afternoon and prevented from going to uh, play with uh, my cousins who lived on the other side of town. Um, mm -hmm. and. I disagreed with this, so I escaped from my my nanny and uh, walked across town. Um, At six. Yeah. Um, okay. And I could really I could barely read the road signs, uh, so I mean, irrespective, this was, I mean, this was obviously a very foolish thing to do because something terrible could have happened to me. I could have been kidnapped or run over or something like that. Right. Um, but I was so determined to uh, go play with my my cousins that I, I basically walked clear across the city, the capital city. At um, six years old. Uh, yeah. And then and, you made it there, so you were successful, so you figured I can do anything I want. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't say it was quite Until like that. Until you got but grounded. I, I did, my, my mom got really freaked out because uh, she saw me, just as I was getting to my cousin's house, she saw me walking along the sidewalk and, and, and flipped out because uh, she didn't know how, how I got there. Um, and then I saw her and I ran and climbed up a tree and... Um, and I, uh, I wouldn't come down until they promised they wouldn't punish me and that I could play with my cousins. And um, so they never punished you? I didn't get punished, actually, but they didn't let me play with my cousins either. Well, that's good. Yeah. So your parents were influential in some ways. They took care of you, even though they let you, you know, find your way across town by yourself. But how did they influence you? Did they, did they make you read? Did they encourage, you know, education? Did they, did they make you go to science camp? Did they make you build yeah. things? Um, I, I was always sort of really uh, interested in reading when I was a kid, um, and I read a everything that I could get my hands on. I read the encyclopedia. I read At every what age? Um, let's see, probably age nine or ten. Okay. Um, you were starting I, I, well, and not that I actually wanted to read the encyclopedia, but I ran out of things to read, so in desperation, I read the encyclopedia. You just um, really wanted to learn. So yeah. at an early stage, you had that, and you had that inner drive yourself. Yeah. So. Um, well, I just, I just sort of, I, I got bored easily, and so unless I was doing something um, like reading or uh, playing a video game or watching TV, and we had like terrible TV in South Africa. It was really bad TV. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there was only at best... You know, so I, I, I like watching TV, right. <laughs> but there wasn't that much of it. So, but the boredom leads to great things. Boredom, no. yeah. So boredom led to a lot of reading. So now, now fast forward, Tesla started in 2003. Yeah. Started in 2003. Wow, that is a big fast forward. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> well, talk about well, we could talk about your 20s and 30s. We won't yeah, do that. Yeah. Okay. So going so to Tesla. We, yeah. So, so talk about the the concept, the idea. What what inspired you? Sure. Um, who, um, were, who was around you to help make this a, an idea, to, a reality? Yeah. Actually, if I can go back a little bit to that, um, you know, a little a little bit further and, and say the origins of why electric vehicles. Um, well, when I was in college, I thought about what are the things that are most going to affect the future of humanity, and the, the three things I came up with were um, uh, the Internet transitioning to a sustainable energy economy, and that means both production and consumption of uh, energy in a sustainable way, mm -hmm. and the third was space exploration. So my interest in electric cars goes back 20 years uh, to when I was in college. And um, 
in fact, the original reason I came out to Silicon Valley was to go to Stanford to uh, work on um, a PhD in applied physics and material science to uh, um, develop uh, advanced energy storage technologies for electric vehicles. Okay. So this is this is a really um, long-standing interest of mine. Uh, right. Goes back to to way way before 2003, um, and um, but the thing that kind of spurred things in 2003 was uh, a lunch that I had um, with uh, Harold Rosen and J.B. Straubel. Um, and, uh, and that, I got this sort of call out of the blue from Harold Rosen. Um, who's, who's, he's a famous guy in space and electric cars. Oh. So he, did, he had something called Rosen Motors, but he also worked, worked for Hughes, um, Hughes Aerospace. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of how the, 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 you know, the connection kind of bridged over. And, and at the lunch, uh, we were just talking about a bunch of things in general. And I, you know, I mentioned that um, I had originally come out to California to work on electric vehicle technologies. And then right. Harold mentioned, you know, t told me his, a bit about his past with Rosen Motors. Um, and, uh, and then JB mentioned that, hey, there's this company um, called AC Propulsion uh, that's, that has this kind of um, very rough prototype electric sports car running on lithium ion batteries. Um, and it's getting you know, really good performance. Um, so I said, that sounds interesting. You know, and um, I thought with the, with the advent of lithium ion, that, that really is a sort of a key enabler for electric cars. Right. Um, um, so uh, JB arranged for a test drive of the AC propulsion T0 in 2003. How many miles did it go back then? Did well, uh, actually, the, the performance specs of the T0 are very, very similar to the Roadster. Oh. Um, Although, but it's a much more primitive car. Um, it's like it's basically like a kit car, mm -hmm. um, it's sort of a, just a fiberglass like cart or something. It's a little better than a golf cart, but it's yeah. not something you could ever sell to people. Okay. Um, like it didn't have a, a roof. Okay. Um, it didn't have any safety systems. Mm -hmm. um, it was very expensive uh, and hand, hand built. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I, I, I tried to convince the AC propulsion guys to uh, commercialize the T0 and said, hey, you know, I I'm willing to fund you if you want to commercialize the T0. Um, but it just wasn't of interest to them. Right. Um, okay. They were a very sort of small uh, outfit. They liked to sort of tinker and experiment, but they weren't really interested, at least at the time, uh, in creating um, a production uh, sports car, electric sports car. So, but I kept pushing them on this, and eventually I said, look, if you're not going to do it, then I'm, I'm going to do it. Um, and, okay. uh, and they said, well, if you're going to do it, there's some other people we should introduce you to. Uh, maybe you guys should team up and, and go and do it. And that's um, how I met uh, uh, Martin Everhard, Mark Toppening, and Ian Wright. Um, and then, um, then JB also joined. Uh, I was actually able to, to convince JB to join uh, Tesla. And so that's sort of like the, the founding team of Tesla was the, was the five of us. So, so when you started thinking about this idea and, and building it out, and there's different entry strategies mm -hmm. right, to, to, to get into the electric car industry. And your goal is to have, make mass market cars. That you created a, a very expensive, not mass market car, $100,000 Roadster, you know, high expensive, low volume. Why, why that entry strategy? Um, it, it's actually, I think the, it's the only um, entry strategy that I thought had any chance of success. Um, and and the, the reason for that is, um, as a small startup, uh, we don't have the economies of scale of, of mm -hmm. the big car companies. Mm -hmm. um, plus, it, we're really working with the first generation of technology. Um, and there, there, there are two things that are really important in uh, uh, making technology available to the mass market and making it affordable. Um, and those two things are economies of scale mm -hmm. and being able to optimize the design. Um, and it usually takes, usually by the third version of something, that's when it kind of starts to reach mass market potential. Right. Um, so using that sort of basic rule of thumb, um, the strategy I had was to start off with um, a high priced low volume car being the sports car. And there's only a few types of cars that people are willing to pay a high price for. Sports cars being one of them, really sure. premium sedans being another. Um, but the easiest way for us to come to market with a long-range car was with a, with a sort of smaller sports car. Um, and then phase two, which we're seeing now, is the Model S, yeah. and that's mid-price, mid-volume. Yeah. And then phase three is the um, high-volume, low-price car. 
or lower price. Right. Yeah. Now, you raised $260 million from your IPO, yeah. about $325 million or so from in private capital and almost half a billion dollars in federal loans to get your cars to market, correct? Yeah. Um, I'd have to check on the number for the private capital. I'm not sure that's it's 300. Um, oh, okay. It might, I, think it's, I think it's less than that. Okay. Um, but Several... Well, a couple hundred million. Let's say it's, million it's, it's, it's here or there. Okay. <laughs> call it a couple hundred million in private capital. You, you raise the money. A couple hundred them. million in IPO, um, and then uh, half of the 460 half, almost million half a billion like in, in government loans. In government although, loans. Although it's important to point out, we've actually only exercised 50 million of the government loans. Okay. Yeah. So okay. it's only a small so portion of it, money. and that only okay. started uh, this year in February. Okay. Um, one of the common misperceptions out there is that we got bailed out by the government last year mm -hmm. um, because... That's very common, isn't it? <laughs> or say everybody's going to bail out. Um, but, but actually, the first government cash we received was only earlier this year in February. Okay. Um, and we did make an announcement last year that we'd received a conditional commitment mm -hmm. uh, from the Department of Energy, um, but it was, it was not... Uh, we didn't actually receive any cash. So if, if we'd needed cash next... Uh, or if we needed cash last year from the government, we'd be dead. So you, but you have a, sort of a credit line from the government. As yeah, like we're essentially have. a credit line. Okay. Um, do you think you'll draw on that, and do you think yeah. that you will need? Okay, so you will draw on that, but you have sufficient funds, and, it, and just what's the probability that you will not have to raise additional money before you get the Model S out in 2012? Well, I, I think we have really, um, it's, it's very unlikely that we will need to raise additional money uh, for the Model S program. Mm -hmm. um, I feel very confident of being able to complete the Model S program for uh, something very close to what we have budgeted, which is on the order of, of half a billion in total. Um, and, okay. Now, it's, it's possible that we could decide that uh, in order to fund developments beyond the Model S that we want to sell some additional equity or something like that. Right, right, um, right. Or, you know, it, it could be that some of our investors want some additional liquidity or, sure. or something like that. But, but we said, I, I feel very confident in saying that we will not need to raise additional capital for the Model S program. Let, let's talk about the Model S. You have them, the, the base price is $49,900. It goes about 160 miles. And then you have, it goes all the way up to 100,000, as you said, and maybe 300 miles or so. But in the next year, actually in the next six months, you're going to have a number of hybrid cars, the GM, car, Volt, Chevrolet Volt, and Volt, Nissan. Yeah, right. Different markets, yes. I mean, 33,000, 41,000, but the car, your Model S is $49,000. You know, that's sort of similar markets. I mean, if you... I wouldn't say the similar markets. Really? Yeah. Well, then, okay. Because you could. Well, wouldn't you want to get somebody in the market for a $41,000 car to upgrade and buy a $49,000 car? Well, I think the best way to, to, to think of the Model S is that it's comparable to, say, a BMW 5 or 7 Series or mm -hmm. an Audi A6, A8. Yeah. Um, so it's really, um, kind of, it's a premium sedan. Okay. Um, and I think anyone who can afford the Model S is not going to be buying the Volt or the Leaf or anything else. It's really, this will be the car that they, that they would prefer. Um, so I think affordability is the only thing that's going to stop people from buying the, the, the Model S. Okay. Um, so so you know, Tesla benefited from the zero emission vehicle program. Yeah. You made about $8 million in that. So to, to what extent did that factor into the decision to make pure play electric cars versus hybrid cars? It didn't, it didn't factor into it at, at all. I mean, the $8 million isn't a lot of money. Um, no, it's obviously it's, it's it's desirable. I think it's it's a good thing, but it, it wasn't it wasn't uh, something that uh, drove our decision. I mean, we really wanted to make um, uh, zero emission vehicles, um, and the Zev Credit thing is helpful in in um, us uh, succeeding in doing that. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. I mean, we've, we could succeed, I think, without the ZEV credits, but um, the ZEV credits done definitely helped. You yeah. wouldn't have done it if they didn't. You would have done it if the credits weren't there. C correct. Yes. Um, but okay. nonetheless, we're still grateful for the credits, and they're certainly helpful. I'm sure. um, but, uh, I mean, the car would be profitable even without the ZEV credits. Is the car, is the company profitable today? When is it going to be profitable? Well, if, if Tesla was, was just, if all Tesla did was make, um, uh, need, was, Make, make sports cars. If we were just a niche, a niche sports car maker and sold powertrains to other car companies, um, we would be profitable today. So we, we, we're 
ru running right now around 20 to 22 percent uh, gross margin. Um, so, you know, any company that's running sort of on the order of 20 percent gross margin can be profitable yeah. if their business, if, if, as long as they don't try to grow their business too fast. But in our case, we are growing our business very fast. Mm -hmm. You know, we're talking about increasing our production volume from roughly 500 cars a year to 20,000 cars a year. Yeah. That's a factor of 40 increase in three years. Yeah. So in three years, do you think, are, are you going to be, are you telling Wall Street you're not going to be profitable for the next three years? Or? Correct. Yeah, yeah, we have. Yeah. And it, it's okay. not really possible to, to be profitable um, okay. because essentially what we're saying is we're going to take half a billion dollars and, uh, in R&D and tooling and that kind of thing and spend that over the next, say, um, roughly 10 quarters. So that's an average of uh, R&D you know, and tooling expense of $50 million a quarter. Okay. Let's talk about your, your strategy, your distribution strategy. That's, a, that's, a, that's something that you're innovating there as well. You hired mm -hmm. the, the head of uh, a veteran at the Apple and Gap stores. Yeah. Um, that says a lot about your strategy as opposed to hiring someone that's a veteran in you know, dealerships. Sure. What's your strategy there? Well, I think for, for, for a lot of people, the car buying experience is quite negative. Mm -hmm. um, they don't look forward to buying a car. Oh, yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that's, that's we, so we, we, we want to try to have a fundamentally superior consumer experience from the moment you think about buying a car to mm -hmm. the, the actual acquisition, the ownership, the service. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we're really trying to achieve something that is uh, substantially superior to what people have experienced in the past. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't want to, we, we, that's why we, we, don't, we, don't, we don't sort of inherit, you know, what was done in the past because it's, it's really, it's not good. I mean, I think if you were to ask most people, um, what's the worst retail experience you've had? I mean, for a lot of people, that's buying a car. Yeah. So yeah. not something you want to emulate. No, that's a that's a. That's well, a anyway, on the other side of the spectrum, innovation. you have like, you know, sort of. I think Apple is arguably the best on the retail front, where people are, are really drawn to an Apple store. Mm -hmm. um, Gap is also excellent in that regard, and so let's you know better to emulate the, their approach than to try to copy the you know the old way of doing business. Yeah. So at Vader, we have a, many entrepreneurs watching this program, and they're always interested in how, how someone fundraises. And you raised money for a car, and you've never had any experience building a car. You had the passion. Yeah. So it, was, it, was it difficult to raise the money for, for Tesla, or is it because you already put $100 million in SpaceX and had enough money? Did, did that make it easier to bring new investors? into your venture? Um, well, I think I had the advantage initially of having the capital from um, uh, PayPal. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was able to do all of the initial uh, funding myself. For Tesla? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, almost all. I shouldn't say all, but like 90% of it. Um, and then there were some other investors. Uh, there were some, some mi minor venture investors in the beginning. So not very. But, but essentially, I did almost all the initial investment myself. Okay. And, and with that initial investment, the first thing we, we did was to try to get a working prototype. How much was that did you put in for the working prototype and in initial um, investment? I think it took us, well, I did most of, like, most of the Series A and Series B. Um, I think I put in probably about 15 million or something like that. Now, Toyota just put in 50 million yeah. into your company, and, and uh, a Daimler also invested $57 million. What are these big car makers learning from Tesla? Um, well, um, the, the relationship in, in the case of Daimler is that uh, we provide them with battery packs and charges for mm -hmm. their smart car and their electric A-Class, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, and also for some of the vehicles in their Freightliner truck division. Mm -hmm. So that's, um, we're essentially a powertrain supplier to them. Um, and then Daimler also um, allows us to access uh, some of their supply chain uh, for parts in the Model S. So, you know, some of the components in the Model S uh, will, will be from sure. the Mercedes supply chain, which sure. is obviously a great, great supply chain. Um, and, then, uh, and then Daimler also wanted to own a portion of, of Tesla, and so they, they invested uh, $57 million. Right. Um, and it's, but it's worth noting that they didn't sell any shares at the IPO. So they, they actually had a three-fold return of their stock, um, and if so, they could have, you know, sold a portion of their stock, recovered all of their cash, and still sure. had a two x return, you know, available. But they didn't sell; they haven't sold any shares. And then Toyota, uh, it's a similar sort of relationship. Um, they are uh, a, um, you know, we're going to be providing the powertrain for the mm -hmm. electric Rav4. 
okay. uh, that's due out in, in 2012. Um, and uh, we also purchased uh, the Numi plant, which was 50% owned by Toyota. Uh, and, Congratulations. Uh, thanks. And then also the, there was the, the Toyota invested 50 million at the IPO. Yeah. So I think um, we certainly have great votes of confidence uh, right. and, and, valid, and validation from... Yes, you do. You know, in the case of Daimler, Daimler is the, co the company that invented the internal combustion engine car. In the case of Toyota, they are the biggest car company in the world. Uh, and the leader in hybrid technology. Um, to have both you know, such great partners is, I think, a, a strong great. endorsement of Tesla. Validation. Yeah. If Tesla bought GM, how would that company look different? <laughs> um, well, it, I think, I think uh, you mean what changes would we institute? If, if, or would great. I institute? If, uh, how would GM look differently? Um, you know, it's always tough you know, for a company that's been around for a century, like as in the case of GM. Um, there's just so much tradition and in kind of uh, entrenched ways of thinking and operating. Um, it, it, I think it's very difficult to, to sort of change uh, GM. Um, but uh, I, I don't know, I'm trying to think of this. I think we'd probably um, try to try to shift the the focus to saying how do you know how do we make the best possible uh, product, mm -hmm. um, and I, I think you really want to um, promote people with a, a strong engineering background and and product design background to the senior ranks in um, in the company. Okay. Um, you know the the path to the CEO's office should not go through the CFO's office. Right. Not, not if you're a product company. Like maybe if you're a financial services company, but not if you're, if you're a product company. Yeah, definitely. So you're running two companies now, Tesla and SpaceX. I mean, very few entrepreneurs can take a company from an idea to the growth stage. Right. And even fewer can take it from the growth stage to an IPO exit. You've done that and you're running a company, another company, and these are two major game-changing companies. What kind of characteristics does an entrepreneur need or have to be someone like you huh. to do what you're doing? Well, I think uh, certainly uh, you need to be very driven and have a high pain threshold. Willing uh, to <laughs> run away from home at six. Yeah, I mean, it's really hard starting a company. I mean, mm -hmm. you have to basically be prepared to work constantly um, you know, from when you wake up to when you, when you go to sleep, um, you have to be willing to deal with um, a lot of difficult problems and thorny problems. Um, you have to be uh, willing to deal with an enormous amount of stress. Um, mm. And uh, you just got to push yourself super, super hard. Um, Okay. I, I, I wouldn't recommend it for most people. <laughs> at, at what point do you say, you know, this is enough, you walk away from one or the other, and which one would it be first? Oh, I mean, I, obviously, I, I, uh, I... It's like twins? You can't right, I mean, like it's sort kids. of like saying, if you have kids, which one <laughs> would you walk away from first? I think that you, you just couldn't do it. You walk, walk away from either, either, either of them. Well, we, I just brought up children, so I have three children, so I'm always curious as to how, how other parents raise their children. With, with five kids, you have five kids on top of everything else you do. Um, what are the lessons you share with them, and how do you encourage them? Maybe you don't want to encourage them to be like you, um, but how do you encourage them to, to be curious, to be bold? Um. Well, I do encourage them to ask questions, you know, that, that like a lot of kids go through this kind of like why stage, you know, you have this sort of chained whys, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. you, you, so I'll say why, uh, you know, why is something this way and then you answer and they say, well, why is that, why is that, why is that? Um, and I, I think uh, answering those questions gladly and, and really encouraging them to ask more questions is definitely a good idea. You want to encourage uh, curiosity, um, you want to encourage uh, tenacity. Um, and uh, you know, just sort of 
yeah, just kind of re reward them with, with praise when they, when they demonstrate kind of good traits. Do you want them to carry on your legacy and, and follow in your footsteps and maybe be the ones to witness the colonization in Mars? And... Um, I, I think it would, be, you know, it would be nice if, if uh, say, at least uh, one or two of the five boys wanted to um, do something in space or uh, automotive or something like that. Uh, I, I, You'll let them choose. Yeah, definitely yeah. let them choose. Um, Let's talk about space. And, 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 and I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm, I am of the school of thought of like uh, Gates and Buffett, which is to, you know, I think it's, you don't want to, you, you want to, I think, uh, leave most of your wealth to sort of charity, I think. And, mm -hmm. Um, you know, rather than try to create um, a legacy empire, um, but it's really tough to to. to I mean, the, the odds of like um, sure. one's child being the the right person to take over a SpaceX or a Tesla, it's it's pretty. I, I think the odds are not that high. Um, it's possible, but the odds are not that high. Let's just talk about SpaceX really quickly. You're now winning contracts to shuttle stuff. Right, in to space replace the space shuttle. Yeah, so congratulations on that. Um, so is, is SpaceX a, you know, essentially a, a trucking freight company in space, um, which is like a good FedEx commercial. For space. It, you're FedEx for <laughs> space. But, you know, it's a commercial endeavor, or is it a pioneering company, next frontier company, which most, you know, you know, probably it will not return you anything for that type of ambitious. Um, well, I should point out that SpaceX has been profitable for the past three years by a small margin. Great. Hopefully it will be profitable this year as well. Um, but is it, is it a bigger, so is it a frontier company or is it a commercial company? Is it both? Well, I think it's kind of both. Okay. Um, you know, we're really pushing the boundaries. Um, you know, I think we've got the most advanced rocket in the world with mm -hmm. our Falcon 9. Um, we'll be, uh, you know, NASA has chosen to outsource the cargo transport function of the space shuttle uh, mm -hmm. to SpaceX, mm -hmm. uh, primarily to SpaceX. And um, with the announcement this year of, from President Obama, that they're actually going to outsource uh, uh, astronaut transport also to the commercial sector, which is, I think, likely to be primarily SpaceX. Mm -hmm. um, so, Great. you know, that's, that's certainly pushing the envelope. And, um, but we would like to go beyond that and ultimately uh, help transport uh, people and cargo to Mars um, and be part of um, extending life beyond Earth. Uh, th those are, I think, are, are, are great things. Now, if you ask me, like, what's the business model for that, I'm not entirely sure. Um, but you think that's <laughs> going to happen in 20 years? I, I am hopeful that um, the first people go to Mars in less than 20 years. And this is aspirational and not predictive. So is extending life beyond Earth and, and getting to Mars, is that enough for you? Or because you're a big thinker, you are, you think about big engineering problems. I'm pretty sure that the oil guys could use your help. And maybe you could think of some <laughs> smart engineering around oil rigs. And, or, yeah, and maybe there's probably. something around deep sea exploration that's, that could be very innovative. But is, is that, is there a future beyond uh, space, or is that really going to occupy the rest of your time? Are, are you done? Are you? It, obviously, that's a big endeavor. You're not done, but that's. Yeah, I mean, the, the, I think both with Tesla and SpaceX, and also with Solar City, um, um, there's just a huge amount of. You know, there's a long way to go, um, okay. and um, you know, particularly if you consider that my goal for SpaceX is to help um, make life multiplanetary. Um, that is just a you know huge endeavor, and we have an enormous distance to, to travel, literally. <laughs> yes. Um, so, uh, will you be living next to Richard Branson in your neighborhood? <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. All right. Last question: Three pieces of advice to entrepreneurs. What are your three pieces? I'm an entrepreneur, so you can share them with me. Okay. What would you? What would you? How would you advise me? Well. Um, I, first of all, I really need to give some thought to like, how can I provide advice that would be most helpful? And I'm not sure I've given enough thought to, to, to that, to, to give you the best possible answer. But I think, um, I think certainly uh, being focused on something that you're confident will have high value to someone else. 
um, and just being really rigorous in making that assessment um, mm -hmm. because people are, tend, tend to, a natural human tendency is wishful thinking. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So a, a challenge for entrepreneurs is to say, well, what's the difference between really believing in your ideals and sticking, sticking to them versus pursuing some unrealistic dream that right. doesn't actually have merit? And it's, it's, that, is a, it, that is a really difficult thing to, to tell you. Can you tell the difference between those two things? Right. You know? So you need to be sort of very rigorous um, in, in your self-analysis. Uh, self um, I think certainly extremely tenacious uh, and, um, and then just work like hell. I mean, you just have to put in you know, 80, hour, 80 to 100 hour weeks every week. And then a lot of work. That, that, that all those things improve the odds of success. Okay. Um, right. I mean, if, 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 if other people are putting in 40 hour work weeks and you're putting in 100 hour work weeks, then even if uh, you're doing the same thing, you know that in, in one year you will achieve what they achieve. You, you, you will achieve in four months what it takes them a year to achieve. Okay. I like your work ethic. So, all right. Thanks, Thanks. Elon.